Let love explode and bring the dead to life. Love so bold to see a revolution somehow. Let love explode and bring the dead to life. Love so bold to see a revolution. Oh! 
cup in your grace everlasting your light will shine with all else face never ending your glory goes beyond all pain
sing that chorus one more time. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you in all life. Let's pray. Lord, just thank you for this uh, night that we can come together and we can worship you, God, as a, as a body here on this campus. And uh, Lord, just thank you for your love and thank you that you did sacrifice yourself for us, God. Lord, that you died on the cross for our sins and rose again. We might be able to be with you again in heaven. Lord, I just pray that you'd be with us tonight as... Uh, be with Dale as he as he speaks tonight about love and about sex and about dating. And God, just uh, help our hearts to be open to it. Help us to learn something new tonight. In Jesus' name, Amen. So we're talking about one love, extreme experience. We've learned that all of your relationships are intertwined like dreadlocks. Remember that? Somebody told me this week, I'm glad you're not talking about dreadlocks anymore. That freaked me out. I'm not sure why, but all of our relationships are connected and, and they, they combine to form this one big love experience. And when we do things apart from God's way, it seems... Sometimes it seems cool, sometimes it seems exciting at the moment, but it leads to lots of regret. It leads to pain, broken hearts, wounds, regrets, shame, guilt. And we've learned the last few weeks that God is not out to mess up our adventure. He's not out, out to mess up our love life. He's not out to take away fun. And if anybody in your life in the church has given you the idea that becoming a follower of Christ means that that's what some people use the word Christian but becoming a Christian a follower of Christ if they've given you the idea that that means you have to check out from reality and you have to become this irrelevant disconnected person who has no clue what's going on in the real world then I want to apologize to you for those who have misrepresented God, misrepresented Jesus, misrepresented to you what the church is really supposed to be about. And I want to encourage you, don't base your, your faith in God on somebody else's poor example. Don't base the decision you make about whether to trust God and to be a part of His kingdom, His family, don't base your decision based on somebody else's poor example. Because if you look at me or anybody else, you'll just find a person who's trying to work out their own relationship with God. And, and some people you'll see growing closer and closer to God and you'll begin to respect and trust that what they have is real more and more. But, but even those people that seem to have a close relationship with God, even those people will stumble sometimes. Because we're all still working things out with God. And this whole life is a journey of growing closer to Him once you trust Christ. And so if you look to me, uh, there may be days where hopefully you can follow my example. Hopefully more days than not. But there will always be a day where, where I, I make a mistake, I, I sin. Hopefully you'll be able to see consistency in my life. And that will be the exception and not the rule for my life. And hopefully as you grow in your relationship with Christ, people will look to you and see 
less and less of the old sin that you used to be involved in and more and more of the new person that God's making you to be so that when you do have a bad day and slip up, they'll see, they will have seen enough change and enough difference to give you the benefit of a doubt and say, you know what, that's not who they are anymore, that's the old them. And it's, they, they really do have a relationship with God. They really are changing. But we've got to work this thing out. And we, we have regrets and we have slip-ups and things in this area of love uh, that we wish we could go back and change. And we've learned that if, if you want your, your love experience from this point forward to be extremely awesome and pleasing to God and and to put your, your faith in something that promises to raise your chances of having a fulfilling experience, less regret, less shame in your life, then you've got to ask yourself some questions. And you've got to ask yourself, what does God say about sex? And we've talked about that. And last week, we began to talk about what does God say about dating? What does God say about dating? And we learned about the Father's presence last week. That if you want your dating life to be extremely awesome from this point forward, you've got to honor the presence of the Father. We talked about the Father. Now I want to tell you about a specific Father. You see the word, the Corvette, up there. Let me tell you about the Corvette and this particular Father and the Corvette. Now this is a true story. I was listening to the radio several years ago and there's a, a show on there, Focus on the Family, and they had this special guest on the radio. And the, the guy that was leading the radio show was talking about dating. And he was talking to parents about what your children need from you, what your teenager needs from you, uh, how you can guide them in this area in their life that a lot of parents aren't doing. And he had this father on there who uh, he was very impressed with, who had this great relationship with his daughter, and he had walked her through these, the, the childhood and the teenage years, and they had an agreement and an understanding what her dating life would be like between the daughter and the father. And I want to tell you a little bit about what I heard on the radio from that father that day. Um, the, the host asked him, how did you... How did you turn out so successful in raising up your daughter and, and, and teaching her what to look out for so that her dating life and her love life and ultimately her marriage turned out so healthy. He said, well, when my daughter was a little girl, I began to cultivate this relationship with her. I began to, um, to teach her that she was valuable, that she was precious to her father that she could feel safe with me, that I would never hurt her, never abuse her, never mistreat her. Sometimes I wouldn't be perfect, but that my daughter would be able to look at me and know that my daddy loves me. Uh, even if my daddy disciplines me, he doesn't hurt me, he doesn't abuse me. Whatever my daddy does, he does because he loves me. And my father's looking out for me, and he wants the best for me. And so he does what I need in order for me to learn that. And he began to talk to her about how beautiful she, she was to him as a father. And, and that one day, when she got older, she, she wasn't interested right now, but one day when she got older, she would get, begin to see boys and notice them differently than she ever had before. And they would begin to notice her in a different way. And one day, some dude would come and ask her out on something they call a date. And they had this ongoing conversation about when that day happens, this is how your father is going to handle that. And so there were no surprises. Father and daughter had this conversation her whole life. And sure enough, when, when she turned 16, this dude asked her out. For the first time, she was asked out on a date. And she knew the deal. And so she told the guy, look, my father and I have an understanding if you want to take me out, you've got to meet my father. It's just how it is. And he's a good guy, but he loves me. And I'm valuable to him. And 
It's important to him who I go out with and who he gives me permission to go out. And you've got to meet my father and, and get his blessing if you want to take me out. And my father expects that and I'm in agreement with that because I, I trust my father and I know he loves me. It's important to me what he says. And so this guy had, he had some guts, he had some nerve, he had some courage, and he had some character. Instead of saying, forget that, he expressed that he was interested enough and, and valued her enough that, and wanted to go out with her badly enough that he would do that. And so this guy comes to her house that night to meet her daddy, her father. And the father's looking out the window, and the first thing he notices is this guy pulls up in this pimped out ride, man. He pulls up in this hot red Corvette. And it, I mean, it looks good. He pulls up in a driveway and he gets out and he comes and he knocks on the door and the father opens the door and lets him in and the daughter introduces him and then she exits the room because they have this understanding and she knows that my father's going to talk to him and she knows what he's going to say. There's no secrets and so the daughter goes so that her father and this guy who's interested in her and she's interested in him can have this conversation. And so she goes and the father introduces himself, and he's nice. He's cool. He doesn't try to threaten him like, like I think I might do when my daughter gets asked out. I might be cleaning my gun or something, but he didn't do anything like that. And he was real nice to him, and he began to talk to him. He said, so you want to take out my daughter on a date? Yes, sir, I, that's, that's what I want to do. He said, that's cool. He said, Oh, by the way, I noticed your car. I noticed the Corvette you pulled up in. It's awesome. That is a really awesome car. And, and he disarmed the guy. He started talking about the guy's car, car, and all of a sudden the guy wasn't nervous anymore. And his car, man, that was his pride. And so he perks up, and he, he, he loosens up, and he's like, Yeah, yeah, man, that's my car. And he's like, Man, that is, that is just a great car. He's like, man, I, I bet you've worked really hard to pay for that car and to fix that car up the way you've got it. I noticed those rims, by the way. And the boy said, and this is a true story, by the way. And the boy looks at him and says, yeah. He gets real excited. He's like, man, I work at Walmart. I don't know if it was really Walmart, but he had some job. I work and I put in a lot of hours and I put in a lot of money and a lot of paychecks to get that car fixed up the way I want it. I'm really proud of that car, man. And the father's like, that's awesome. He says, I'll tell you what. Why don't you toss me the keys and let me take it for a drive? And all of a sudden, the guy is nervous again. And he's like, uh, um, no disrespect, sir, but I've really worked hard to get that car like it is. I've put in a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of elbow grease. I, I, I'd really love to let you drive it, but I can't. I don't let anybody else drive my car. Well, why not? I'm just too afraid it might get a scratch or a dent. And the father said, I understand. And then he looked at him and he said, And son, he said, as much as you love that car, as much as you value that car, I love my daughter a hundred times more. And you're asking me tonight to take my daughter out for a drive. Son, I'm going to let you do that. But I want you to understand I'm expecting you to bring her back without a scratch, without a dent on her heart. I'm expecting you to treat her the way I would treat her. I'm expecting you to look out for her in my place since I'm letting you go instead of me tonight. I had a friend, by the way, one time, when his daughter was asked out, he had that same kind of meeting with the guy. And he said, I'm not going to let you take my daughter on a date. We're not going to call it that. But he said, what I am going to let you do, I'm going to let you take her to this dance. I'm going to let you be her chaperone. And you could chaperone my daughter, but as my daughter's chaperone, you're going in my place. And he said, so what that means is, if I was with my daughter at that dance, I would make real sure nobody offered her drugs. 
I would make real sure nobody tried to have sex with my daughter or force themselves on her. So if you want to chaperone my daughter and take her out in my place, then you need to love her like I would love her if I was there. I would die for my daughter, he said. This is what my friend said, a different story. He's an ex-army ranger, by the way. He's a preacher now. All preachers haven't always been preachers, but that's another story. He said, I would die for my daughter. And he said, are you willing? He said, if somebody tries to push drugs on my daughter or push sex on my daughter, I expect you to be willing to die for her to keep it from happening, just like I would. Do you still want to take my daughter out? So yes, sir, I do. I won't. He said, good. Because if you're not willing to die for her, if something like that happens and I find out you didn't try to stop it, I might kill you myself. <laughs> That's what he said. Um, and he was, part, he, was, he was partly joking about the kill you, but he was making a point. All these, these, two, these stories that say this, everybody doesn't have that father earthly father but everybody everybody who trusts in Jesus Christ as their Savior and their Lord becomes an adopted child of God no matter what they've done no matter where they've been and the instant you trust your heart to Jesus Christ God takes hold of your life and he says I'm your father and so even guys if you're out on a date with this girl I notice a lot of guys didn't come back this week after last week did they that's just an interesting fact. If you're going to take that girl out, even if you think, well, she doesn't have a dad who really cares what I do, I can do whatever I want, you're wrong. Because every person that God has created is valuable to Him, no matter what anybody else thinks of them. And God the Father is always present. He's present in the back seat of that car. He's present in the back room. He's present. And I'm not, I'm saying this to encourage all of you who are trying to have more control. To all of you who are trying to, to say, I want to I do things a better way. I don't want it to always be about sex and all that stuff. It's it just, don't want it to always be about that. I like to be able to just go out together from time to time and, and not even have to think about that. And, for those of you who care, uh, care about that or are interested in having that kind of self-control in your life. That if you will remember the Father is present and you will treat that person that you're with like His child. This person I'm with is a child of God. And not just guys and girls. Girls treat the guys that way too. I need to respect this guy as a child of God and any influence I have on him needs to be influencing him to do things that honor his father if you'll think about God the father being present and that he cares and that he values that person that you're with it will motivate you to treat them much more respectfully than you would if you just didn't care and if you love somebody, you'll want to treat them like they're valuable because they're valuable to God. So we talked about you need to honor the Father's presence. I want to tell you another thing you can do to make your dating life extremely awesome. Not only do you need to honor the Father's presence, but honor the Father's expectations. Did you know that God the Father has some expectations for the kind of person that He wants you to choose to date? Or to go out with? God has expectations for who you date. Who you choose to date. I want to share with you what those are. And I want to, I want to share with you from Genesis 2.24. Scripture that we read before about marriage and all that. And that's what I have to go on because honestly I've looked all through the Bible and I can't find anything about dating. I find stories in the Bible about engagement um, and, uh, and marriage and things like that. But it doesn't just come out and say, dating, one, this, these are the ten rules for dating. God doesn't say that. 
But I can look through the Bible and I can find principles about how He wants us to treat one another. And I can find principles about what He says about what love is supposed to look like. And I can take that and I can put that into the world of dating and it will help me make good decisions about dating. It will help you. Well, I'm already married, so. But I still need to date my wife. Some people are married and they quit dating each other. And they just get old and crabby and the flame goes away. God even wants married people to keep going out on dates and romancing each other. Keeping the flame alive, man. Married people should be dating each other. So put this into the dating perspective. Now listen to this. Genesis 2.24 says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Do you all remember me reading that to you before? And the man and his wife were both naked. It says it in the Bible. And they were not ashamed. They felt no shame. So the last verse says that there's a time for sex to happen. And it can, it can be experienced without shame. But first, the, the, they need to leave their father and mother and be united and become one flesh. So, dating, the best way to look at dating is this. The purpose for dating, the world will tell you the purpose for dating is sex and just trying out different people to see what works and all that kind of stuff. But if you're trying to live for God, the purpose for dating is this. Practice for how you're going to treat the person you marry one day. That's the best purpose for dating. Practice for how you're going to treat the person you marry one day. So, if we're looking at dating that way, this is an opportunity for me to practice how I want to treat my wife, how I want to treat my husband, how I want to be treated, then you can take the same things that God says about marriage and sex and you can put it into your dating life. So if you're practicing becoming that person that you need to be one day, you can also practice choosing the right person. And one day when, when, it's, when you have the opportunity for marriage and, and total freedom to make all your own decisions and choosing how you're going to live your life and what your family's going to look like and how you're going to do that, then you can start practicing right now what kind of person you're going to choose. And you can use your dating life for that. So what kind of person should you choose? What does God expect? Number one, choose somebody who's responsible. Everybody say responsible. 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 Dale, where did you come up with that? Are you making that up? I always want to show you in this chapel where I get the things that I say. That comes right out of Genesis 2.24 where it says, before this man and woman experience sex without shame and guilt, the very first thing it says is that this man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The, father, the, the man will leave his parents. The woman will leave her parents. They become independent. Remember that? It means they become responsible. They don't have to have mom and dad paying for all their clothes and all their bills and all their car payments and all their insurance and all their medical needs. They are now at a point in life where they have become responsible and prepared to be able to do that for themselves. And that's the first step in becoming ready to experience sex the way God intended it. Because with sex comes responsibility. And you know, God's not, He's not um, just out there on a cloud somewhere. The, things that, the, the expectations that God gives us is for practical reasons. Because God knows if you have sex, might have a baby. If you're having sex, you just might have a baby. And if you just might have a baby, it would be a really good idea if you were at a place where you're able to take care of that baby. If you just might have a baby because that's kind of one of the things that goes with sex, if it just might happen, then you just might want to make sure you're ready to do something about that and take care of that child like you want to be taken care of. That's why God says, 
It's important that you be at a place in life where you're ready to be responsible and you're able to be responsible. So what's this have to do with dating? Hold up. Here's what that means, ladies. If you're choosing who you're going to go out with, don't just say yes to every dude that asks you out. Don't just say yes just because they got a car, a cool car. Don't just say yes just because they look good. Don't just say yes just because if I go out with that one, everybody else is going to be impressed with me. I saw, him, I saw Cody go like this. Don't just go out for him just because they got some money. Is that what you're trying to say? Thank you. Don't just go out with some guy. Don't just go out with some girl just for those reasons. Obviously, you want them to look good. Obviously, you want to be attracted to the person that you're interested in. I mean, that's normal. God made it that way. But don't let that control you. Look at a few people who look good and then, and then decide which one of them is responsible. This guy wants to take me out and let me trust myself with him without anybody else around? Is he a responsible person? Is he someone that I want to invest my time? My life is valuable. My time is valuable. Do I want to give up a whole evening of my time and my life and myself to spend with this guy or this girl? Well, one of the things that you, that I want, that you, want you can use to determine that is are they responsible? We'll say, well, I'm only 14. I'm only 15. He's only, you know, 16. He, he can't have a full-time job. He's, he's still in school. Dating at its best is practice for choosing who you're going to spend your life with one day. I'm not saying you can't date until you're old and have a job. But I'm saying it's not a good point for you to be married right now. But if you're going to date, then choose people who are becoming the type of man or the type of woman that you would want to spend the rest of your life with. If, if, if his main responsibility right now is go to school, is he responsible with the way he goes to school? Does, if his job right now is getting through the program at Davis Stewart, is he responsible? Is he just trying to hook up with you just because he wants to take advantage of you? Is she just trying to get with you just because she wants to take advantage of you? Or is this person somebody that wants to get to know you and spend time with you? Is this a responsible person? Because if they're responsible with the things that they're doing, if they're a part of a sports team and they're responsible with being at practice on time and doing what they're supposed to do, if, if they're in school and they're responsible about doing their work and doing the best they can, they don't have to make straight A's all the time, but are they being responsible with what they do, do right now? Then if they are, they might be someone who's becoming the type of person that you could spend the rest of your life with. They might be somebody that you might want to go out on a date with instead of this other loser. Choose someone who's responsible. Because God says, if you want to be married and have a, a great love life and experience sex the way He intended it, you've got to be ready to leave home and be responsible. So date somebody who's a responsible person. Number two, is this helping you any? Is it helping you yet? Okay. Choose someone who's committed. Genesis 2.24 says he will leave his mother and father responsible. And he will be joined to his wife. That means they'll get married. Joined. They'll get married and they'll be committed. Marriage is a commitment. It's a promise. And God takes promises seriously. You're not ready to get married right now. It's not a good time for you to get married right now. Well, one day it will be a good time and a right time. Meanwhile, if you're going to date somebody to 
to practice how you're going to relate to that person you're going to be with one day. Then choose somebody who shows commitment in their life. Do they start stuff and never finish anything? Are they committed to what they do? Do they sign up for an um, equine group? And, and then two weeks later, Carol doesn't know where they're at? See what I'm saying? Do they, do they make commitments and keep them? Because I'm going to tell you what. They can't keep their commitment to an equine group for six weeks. They're not going to keep a lifelong commitment to you one day. Do they keep their commitments? Do they promise I'm going to be here at this time for you? And do they consistently keep that? I'm not, and sometimes we miss appointments, and I do that sometimes. But do they over and over and over again make promises and don't keep them? Make promises and don't keep them. Make promises and don't keep them. If they do, I'm not saying they're a bad person. If that's you, I'm not saying you're a bad person. I'm just saying you're not ready. A person who can't keep commitments is not ready to have other people entrust their heart to them. So if you want your dating life to go well as practice for marriage one day, choose people who are responsible. Choose people who know what commitment means. And when you see somebody who's not responsible and they don't keep their commitments, you know they're not going to be responsible with you and they're not going to keep their commitments to you. And don't fool yourself and think that they're going to treat you any differently than they do everything else in their life. They won't. And they can charm you and they can smile at you and they can flutter their eyes at you, but they will not treat you any different than they do the rest of their responsibilities and their commitments. Are you with me? So choose somebody who's responsible. Choose somebody who's, who's committed. Or at least they're becoming more responsible and more committed at what they do. One more. Choose someone who is unselfish. This comes from the Bible. It says he'll leave his father and mother. They'll be united. They'll be joined together. And they will become one flesh. That means... They will share everything they have with each other. They will share their possessions. They'll, they'll share their, their life. They'll share their heart. They'll share their hopes. They'll share their dreams. They'll share their tears, their hurts, their pains. They won't be too selfish to share with you. And so if you want to make sure your heart doesn't get broken, choose somebody who's unselfish. Somebody who will share their french fries with you. Right? Somebody who, who won't just want to be with you when it's convenient for them, but they'll want to be with you when you need them to be there. Somebody that won't just tell you how beautiful you are when they're just trying to get something out of you, but someone who will treat you like you're beautiful and like you're valuable and like you're important all the time consistently look for somebody who's not selfish and see if you can remember that there is a father who is present when you're when you're together with this person and you can remember that that father has expectations for who you spend your time with you will make better choices and you'll have less regret do you understand yet do you get it yet that God's on your side He's not trying to mess up your life and take away your fun. He's trying to show you a better way. Sometimes God says, wait on some things right now because I want to give you something better later. And so I just want to encourage you tonight. If you want your dating life to be extremely awesome, raise your standards. The next person to ask you out after you get past the excitement of this person wants to this person wants to be with me get past that and let your emotions settle down and say okay wait a minute now I really like this person I really like to get with this person 
I'd love to go out with them. I'd love to date this person. I'd love to meet up with this person. I'd love to spend time with this person. Stop a minute and ask yourself, as much as I'm attracted to this person, are they responsible? Are they committed to what they do? And are they unselfish? Because if they're irresponsible, if they're, un- if they're not committed and they don't take promises very seriously, and they're selfish, not going to be good for you. They're not going to value you, and they're not going to give a rip about what your father thinks, your heavenly father. So remember these things, and I dare you. I dare you to try it. I dare you to raise your expectations for who you date. And I dare you when you say, are they responsible? Are they committed? No, they're not. They don't keep any promise they make. They're not trying to, they're not trying to improve anything. They just look good. At least right now they look good. They're not, they're not trying to honor God in any way. They just want to get with me for, not, for now. I dare you to just say, I'm more valuable than that. I'm worth more to God than that. No, I'm not going out with you. Meet up with yourself tonight. Because I won't be there. I'm saving myself for someone who's responsible and committed and unselfish. And I'm not going to cheapen myself tonight to settle for anything less. You need to learn to love yourself that way because God loves you that way. Start treating yourself like a child of God and you'll be real glad you did. And you won't have all this guilt and shame and regret connected with your relationships anymore. I dare you to do it. Let's pray. Father, you're awesome and you're holy. And I thank you for your word and your truth. And this is just really real. And I just pray for everybody here tonight. And I believe just the right people who are just ready to hear this are here tonight. I pray for every girl, every boy, every young man, every young woman every man and woman in this room tonight that you would help us to go out of here and to understand how much you value us and help us to value ourselves and help us not to settle for cheap love cheap thrills cheap sex Help the people in this room tonight to go back to their cottage and back to their homes and back to their schools and wherever you send them and help them to be able to live this out and be one of the few people who's getting it right so that when other people are having shame and guilt and regret, they can look at their lives and say, what happened to you? How come you don't have all this regret anymore? And they can say, Jesus has taught me a better way and he can teach you too I pray that you give all of us the strength to keep ourselves pure this week and to make good choices about who we love and who we trust our hearts to in Jesus name Amen